Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Why are most voices in the regenerative movement coming from the global north and why simply investing in regenerative agriculture isn't good enough and what does real regenerative investing look like? And how does the touch historically difficult topics for investors like control, trust and more? And how can we let investors being seduced and fall in love with the Latin American biodiversity wealth? Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash egg or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another episode today with the Chief Purpose Officer and Co-Founder of SVX Mexico. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Cohen. It's great to be here. And to start with the personal question we always love to ask, how did you end up focusing on regeneration, on soil, on agriculture and land use? Wow, it's been quite a journey. I used to be a banker back in 2008. I was in, in two very big institutions and, you know, being very competitive and, and learning so much about finance and and something inside me kept questioning the ethical issues about my everyday activities. And there was some health issues as well. And of course, you know, some ethical dilemmas in general, where you start questioning and your life. And I was 29 years old when I had my first panic attack. And that day for me was an inflection point. I was laying on the floor of my office and I was thinking that if I died that day, I would have only helped the rich become richer. And I did not want my life to be that. I used to be very different before I was a banker. So I, I decided to quit the bank and I decided to look for ethical investments or ethical banking. I didn't even know it existed. In Mexico, all of those trends, you know, were not very much alive at the moment. So I started learning about impact investments and I started learning about responsible investments. And my quest started in 2014. And finally, in 2016, I got to meet John Fullerton from the Capital Institute. And John Fullerton was talking about regenerative economy. And from that day, it was like I found my calling. I found my mission. And I definitely thought, like, I was really excited by impact investing since 2014. But I was wondering that impact was so vague and everything and anything was considered impactful that I was wondering where the direction of impact was going and even if it had any direction at all. So when I finally came across regenerative economy, for me, that really, really gave me direction and that gave me purpose and that gave me so much more. And in the first months of getting to know John Fullerton, we were invited to a regenerative retreat precisely where I put my hands in the soil. And this was in a farm in northern New York. It was just an amazing experience. We really spoke with the farmers. We really literally dug our hands into the soil, learned about all the processes and all the syntropy that you can learn in the natural processes. And we could really, we really got to see the differences of land assets that were regenerated with some years versus the ones that were just beginning. And we started to see like the differences. And I was just overwhelmed with emotion and excitement and saying, wow, like this is something worth dedicating your life to. And this is something worth, you know, a life mission. So ever since I started learning about impact investing, there's a quote that has been my mission, which is that capital serves humanity instead of governing it. And so putting capital at the service 
has really made me reflect a lot about like who has been at the service of humanity all these years and who has been like the most generous bank in the history of humankind. And of course, the most generous bank in the history of humankind has been the soil that is very distributed by design and that is always nourishing and that is always nourishing everyone. So for me, the soil is literally the example of how I want a bank to be in the future and for capital to be like the water and basically like started to reflect on how to really put all of those metaphors into real action. And that's how I started. <laughs> Super inspiring. And, and that putting your hands in the soil, I think many can reflect on that as well, or can recognize it listening to this, that it's a very, if you haven't grown up on a farm, of course, or with a big garden or having spent the summers digging in soil, that it's a very profound experience. So bringing that back to Mexico, because Northern New York is very different. What were your first steps? How did you approach that, putting that into practice? Well, a lot of things were going on at the time in, in Mexico. And there was a fund in Mexico that is a, a sustainable agriculture fund that was called Grupo Paisano. And for me, the experience of getting to know them was definitely a life-changing experience precisely because they really took me to the farms and they really took me to eat and be with all these farmers. And I realized that the finance professionals, we are so far away from what is happening on the ground and on the grassroots communities. And the grassroots communities are really far away from what's happening in finance, right? So there's this huge distance between those two worlds and there's two languages that are spoken that are very different. And when you put yourself at the service of something, you become kind of like a translator between those two different languages. And you really become much more humble because you understand that in finance, the finance world is very dominating, is very ego driven. And there's so much vocabulary, you know, that is just fancy on purpose so that people don't understand it. And so the more I try to hyper simplify concepts and the more I try to see how much understanding could, you know, come from a farmer of a financial concept, the more I realized what is my vocation and my real mission there as that translator between those two worlds. So one example that I wanted to bring up because of that fund was that this fund wanted to be a social justice fund for the farmers. And they wanted to bring, you know, the solidarity economy to the farmers. And what they wanted to do is that the entity where the investment comes in was structured so that it would be exited by the investors and bought back completely by the smallholder farmers. So at the end of the investment period of, let's say, 10 to 12 years, 100% of the company will belong to the farmers. So that model was very contrarian in so many ways, and it's called self-liquidating equity. And I was really wondering that the, some of the smallholder farmers that we were working with did not even know how to read and write. And I was really worried, like, how can they be shareholders if they don't know how to read and write? So I was taking some videos with my cell phone in the visits in the communities. And I was asking one farmer, his name is Don Alejandro. And Don Alejandro was like very excited, you know, showing me his tomatoes and showing me like everything he was doing. And I asked Don Alejandro, hey, do you understand how this works? Do you understand like what structure they're proposing to you? And he was looking at me kind of offended. And he was like, how do you even ask that question? Of course I understand. Right now I'm a partner, he said, and I used to be labor. And that's where I, you know, immediately understood like what is he understanding and what is the important stuff, the fundamental stuff of what they're doing? And he was right. He was absolutely right. And he gave me the example of like, you know, the way he took care of the truck when it was the truck of the boss is very different of the way he took, takes care of the truck now that it's his and everyone's. So it's just those tiny experiences, those little examples of the day by day getting to know what's the reality for farmers versus what's the reality in the term sheet or the financial documents and like looking at those gaps, but looking at the fundamental ways that you can bridge those gaps and that you can really translate and that you can really connect and that people can get excited in both sides. That was for me very life changing and I really enjoyed it. But I did not know regenerative agriculture until a couple of years later. 
So when I saw that regenerative agriculture could be very accessible and very inclusive, and the fact that the input cost would be way less once you're in this new spiral of abundance, I even got more and more excited because the social justice that can come from that can be very powerful. And the potential that you can unleash is amazing for everyone. So what I'm seeing right now in the impact investment ecosystem in Latin America, at least, is that there are very human-centric, social-centric initiatives and projects and organizations that are only taking into account like the social impacts. And then there's others that are working more on the conservation side and on the environmental side, and they are usually very divided and they're not necessarily talking to each other. Because one is very human centric and very much looking at the social causes and the social indicators. And the others are just, you know, looking at the trees and the species that they're conserving. And, and so usually this is work that is done separately. And in regenerative agriculture is the first time I saw that holistic potential where you can really work on both the social justice side and the environmental justice side at the same time and in a very indivisible and interconnected way. So for me, that is like the most beautiful potential of like not having to work separately, not being a divorced cause, but rather a holistic one. And that way there is no way of saving any human rights or any humans if we don't have air to breathe and drinkable rivers and thriving ecosystems. And soils, yeah. Exactly. So thriving communities need thriving ecosystems and vice versa, right? So that's where I, you know, I got m even more excited about this theme precisely because that's the way I, I want to engage in the world holistically. So that's extremely interesting. I always wonder, I love the alternative exit structures. I love this tinkering with those kind of things, but what was the reaction or what have you seen in the future as well later on of investors that are still, it comes back time and time again in this podcast, they need, or they, they are very used to the 10 year structure or a loan has to look like this, et cetera, et cetera. So what is your experience there after you have, let's say, seen that farmers, or at least the one you talked to was very aware what he was signing up for, but what has been the reaction from investors to these kind of, let's say, edgy structures? Well, we have taken the opportunity to always start with investor education. What we say is that we cultivate regenerative investors. <laughs> That's our crop. <laughs> so basically in SVX, we're cultivating investors. And the way we do it is we start with education and the way we do the thought leadership around it is precisely starting with the holistic spectrum. And the holistic spectrum is just some thought leadership that we developed off of the spectrum of Bill Reed. Of course, you know, the quadrants of Bill Reed, right? So we just applied that to investments and we said, okay, there's destructive investments that lead you to massive death. And then there's extractive investments, which you all know. And then there's the responsible ones. And the one in the middle, the bridge one is of course, sustainable investments because that's the neutrality point, right? That's the net zeros and all of those that are minimizing damage, but are not necessarily adding value. So be, after the sustainable investments, we see the social enterprise. In the social enterprise, you start with the end of a, you know, of a purpose, a social or environmental purpose to solve. So you start adding value. But then there's transformative finance. And in transformative finance, I have found the most amazing structures, the most exciting structures and the most fun structures, but precisely the ones that require a new paradigm of thinking from the investors. So the transformative paradigm, I don't know if you've ever had a podcast with Andrea Armeni or Morgan Simon. No, not yet. No. So Morgan actually was one of the co-founders of Tonic back in the day, but she's also the co-founder of Transform Finance. And in her book of real impact, she has three principles, but they are basically summed up in nothing for me without me, which means Instead of looking as, at farmers or whoever as beneficiaries, you actually think of them as partners. And it is very different to think of somebody as a recipient of impact versus somebody as a change maker and that everyone can be a change maker. So in those principles, you kind of talk a lot about how they can be owners. If they're not co-owners, co-designers with you, it is very likely that you are getting the better off end than somebody else of your stakeholders. So those transformative finance principles for me really changed my life in terms of the financial structures that we want to favor. 
We want to favor the ones that are distributive by design. We want to favor the ones that are collaborating and we want to re-indigenize finance. So we have a lot to learn from the indigenous communities. They have been the stewards of the biodiversity all this time. They are regenerative by nature. You know, they have like all the principles, they're just there. So we have a lot to learn from them. So the power dynamic of transformative finance is really transformative because instead of the investors being the decision makers on top and that very toxic power dynamic of domination, it becomes more of a conversation where everyone learns. And instead of us coming to the communities to teach them how to do stuff, we come to learn. We come open to listen. We come open to value their voice and their wisdom and what they already know right? That is very different from coming from this domination paradigm. And instead of risk shifting, it's risk assuming. So we assume risk because everything else that finance does is shift risk around to the stakeholders that are the most vulnerable. And of course, the risk to the investor is like one or 2% of their return. And the risk to the farmer is like their livelihood and their skin and their sight and everything, you know, and their families. So it's very different. And in the transform finance principles, that is like the center, you know, that is very important. So that's where the self-liquidating equity comes in. And like all of these structures start making sense once you understand the, the transformative finance principles. And what we say is that to get to regenerative investments, the portal is a transformative finance because we think Regenerative finance is not only about what you're investing, it's also how you're investing in it and why, of course. If we're still investing for the purpose of perpetuating capital and capital's eternal reproduction, we're still on the extraction paradigm. But if we are in a unity paradigm, in the paradigm of we're all interconnected, then I realize as an investor that my thriving life is codependent, absolutely codependent in your thriving life. Oh no, everyone is. Exactly. And the larger web of life. And I start being less human centric and more ecocentric, more centric on life than on human life. Right. So what I see is that there's an evolution of investors that are changing only the what they're investing in. Oh, I'm, I'm investing in different inputs of the soil. So now I'm regenerative. But then there's like, you know, deeper ones that are also changing the how. And do you see them going through that? Like, do you see, because I always wonder, like, I see people getting hooked on soil. Now it sounds like a drug, but getting interested in the potential and seeing that and then usually slowly going deeper and deeper down the spiral and, and getting deeper in that holistic view. Do you see that's the same also happening with investors going further down the continuum, like say towards regen, they start questioning more and more, or do many get stuck and stay stuck for a long time? I think everyone's on a different transition and a different speed. And precisely because everyone has a different role and come from a different generation. And I think we're very contextual in that, you know, the human behavior is very contextual. You are very contextual to your time and your role and your context, right? And I am too. I am a consequence of the time that I'm living and the role that I'm playing or roles that I'm playing and the context that I'm living. I'm very Mexican, you know, and I'm very, <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a Mexican ex-banker. So it's a very different context than other Mexican, right? So I think everyone has a limited perspective of the context that we're in. And I think many are more awake or ready to change than others. And precisely because it depends on what they have to lose or how much they need to shift paradigms. And what has happened to us when we start education, sometimes there's some investors that like from the first day of our education to the last, they have, you know, changed so much and so many paradigms shifts. But then there's some that take some years and then they come back. And they're like, now I'm ready. And it just happened actually this week. One investor that took our course in 2019, he did his first regenerative investment this week. So the, actually the deposit came yesterday and we were like super, super happy. And it took him a while, but the very first time he looked for us, he came because he wanted to change his investments. And this was on 2019. And all these years, you know, he has been learning, he has been getting... Fermentation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, the trust is the currency. You know, our currency is trust. 
And the more he trusts, because he really went into studying very deeply and he got to know the Regenesis people and blah, blah, blah. And now he trusts and now he values differently. So now he moves. But that's just one case. There's many cases. So I think we are very radical, I would think, in our education, precisely because we want people to leave shifted. It doesn't matter how long they take to take action because that's depending on their times. But at least if they go through it, you know, they will be shifted somehow and they will feel questioned and they will question the deepest paradigms and they will question the purpose of capital and they will question how much their capital is being a manifestation of themselves. And just one example of this week, this is another family. This family was having a very social justice transformative policy, but they were calling it a Trojan horse for the bigger family's wealth. And I was saying, wait a minute, you know, the Trojan horse is a war metaphor where you have an unfair advantage of deceit. So if you really want like the purpose of regeneration and you're like putting like a war statement, like, you know, we think regeneration comes from within. And there's a beautiful Hindi wisdom phrase that is that if the egg breaks from the outside force, life ends. And if an egg breaks from the inside force, life begins. So anything that is good has to come inside out. I mean, there is something there with the Trojan horse that came from the inside. But yeah, no, I get the tension there, obviously. Yeah. But it's very different to come from the inside to kill with an advantage of the seat than to come from the inside force for rebirth. And how did they change? Or did they change? What was their response to when you brought it up? Precisely. <laughs> so that investment policy they accepted that had been written with some anger. And so basically, they really made a reflection that perhaps this is the opportunity for rebirth. Perhaps this is the opportunity for a restart. And perhaps this regeneration that we want to do with the capital, it has to start within to a healing that is internal before we, you know, go and do healing outside. So, I mean, that was just our reflection this week, right? But it's those kind of things that we have really gotten into in our education. So like very much about the questioning of the paradigms, where we're coming from in like the way that we're acting our investment thesis or investment selection or pipeline or term sheets. Because if we're still coming in a paradigm of control, our term sheets will say so instead of like coming from a paradigm of liberation and a paradigm of love and a paradigm of regeneration for real, you know? So we try to be, maybe we're like combining very hippie stuff. <laughs> yeah, but then with it coming from a banker or an ex-banker, that, that's very interesting. And then, so you're trying to, to shock in a good way or to have people go through those transformations by in their own speed and time. But then they come back to you and say, okay, now I'm ready to invest. You work as well. Because then you say we actually do some of these transactions. So what are the examples then that you are able to, if you have worked over the last period, that are regenerative investments open to people that are ready, let's say, for that? Oh, well, there's been some lovely examples, but we act as advisors. So that is very important. We might take the plunge of going into management precisely at the end of this year. But right now we act as advisors only. So right now we're advising around $41 million dollars. And the way we influence or advise has a limited, of course, responsibility to what they actually do, right? So there are some things that are more regenerative <laughs> than others, precisely because we can shift the paradigm as much as we want. But at the end, the ultimate responsibility of the capital allocation is, is not ours yet. So that's where I want to, you know, just be careful on, on like, Everything we want to do is inspire them into a regenerative process, but not every one of our investments are fully regenerative in my point of view. So one, for example, that I like very much, I don't know if you've ever heard of Playa Viva. So the beauty about Playa Viva, it's in a beautiful state in Mexico. It's one of those states that is just magical and the natural capital and the biodiversity and the population, like everything there is magical. The thing is, it's a very conflictive state. And in conflictive, I mean drug lords, drug cartels, like conflictive. Actually, the name of the state in Mexico is called Warrior, Guerrero. <laughs> but it has beautiful beaches. It's like, it's, it's paradise. Like really, the beauty of the place is just amazing. It's very fertile soil, but it has its issues. 
So what's happening? There's so much migration from the communities that are, you know, most vulnerable, precisely because of all this insecurity. And Playa Viva came more than a decade ago, and they started doing precisely the process with Regenesis. And they started seeing, you know, what if we see this land as a potential paradise? Because it is. It is a potential paradise. And now that I see it all regenerated and beautiful, of course, you absolutely believe it from day one. But I can imagine a decade ago or more how it was when they first came in. And I think it was harder to imagine the paradise. But basically, they started listening to the community. They started listening to to like the history of place, like all of that deep engagement of place and to acknowledge that we are only stewards of a very short time period of place. And place has been around for, you know, millennia and like the deeper history of place. So basically they really listened, they really went in and they started doing this beautiful experience. So Playa Viva, it's a really pure experience when you go because it's a eco-touristic hotel that it's really, really large. There's so many hectares. They have regenerated so much. It used to be a monoculture farm for coconut and tamarind. And now it has, you know, farm to table, not only for their hotels, but like the hotels in the surrounding areas. They have like deep engagement with the communities. There's a turtle sanctuary that they save in so many turtles. And there's a mangrove regeneration of the bay. And they're taking care of a lagoon that is for the fishermen right next to Playa Viva. And it's It's an estuary, it's a bay, it's so beautiful. Like I had never been in touch with uh, coastal regeneration until I went to Playa Viva. And it's it's just too beautiful to imagine. And it's really simple and it's really humble. And the architecture, you know, it's you're like really in open air, like there's no air conditioning. Everything is solar panel powered and it's just beautiful. You turn off the fan when there's rain. and you get like the real breeze. So it's a very different experience for you. And I think it's very transformative that even as a consumer, you get to participate in that regeneration and you get to save the turtles and and you get to go to the farm. So I think it's a all-in-one experience. And that's the investment that we closed this week, for example. So my question is going to be how, because I, I know the case a bit through Tonic, but how is that on the finance side also regenerative? Like what, what excites you beyond being an absolutely piece of paradise, as it sounds like an absolute piece of paradise. But how does it differ from maybe other pieces of paradise that have been financed differently, if you know, and if that's an interesting example from that point of view? Well, in that one, we haven't been able to recommend structures at all. It's just debt. It's just very benevolent debt. So in that one, we haven't been, you know, involved in the inside of the structure. But there is some possibilities in Playa Viva, new possibilities of new projects that they are working on that I don't know if I can share yet. Let's not do it, but yeah, we should have them on. Yeah, Yeah, they're amazing. Definitely have them. David Leventhal is, is amazing and he has so much to share and very humbly. Very interesting. And And also there, I think the investors, from what I know, have responded positively and have been investing in these kind of structures and and in this this case, depth, but obviously in a challenging environment or in a very ambitious environment. Uh, And in terms of agriculture, I know you've been working also on some interesting aspects. What's been the most, I wouldn't say exciting because, of course, it's like choosing your babies, but what's been the most surprising one you've worked on in the past years where maybe regeneration also in the investment terms really came to flourish? There's two. So one that is right in front of me. So in Mexico, succulents are are very popular right now. And basically it's an ornamental plant, but it's part of the Mexican biodiversity. So this is a couple that work for the largest public university in Mexico, which is UNAM. And basically UNAM has a natural protected area of its own. Like the university is so, so big that it has a natural protected area. And that natural protected area had a botanical garden, but that botanical garden, to be able to keep it up, it takes a lot of budget. And right now there's a lot of government cuts and so little budget that basically this couple had to start doing some research and investigation to use the plants of the Mexican biodiversity to be able to get the costs and increase the population of those plants. So basically, this is endemic species of Mexico that is mostly cactus, 
but it's cactus in different ways. Like there's so many shapes. There's so many shapes and there's so many colors. There's purple ones. There's pink ones. There's ones with flowers. There's green ones. So basically it looks like a cactus and it has the same properties. So it, it is very good for arid environments and it stores a lot of water. And they're very resilient. They're the most resilient plants you can imagine, but they're also very beautiful and they're low maintenance, right? So in terms of ornamental plants, in terms of like the plants that people are used to including in their decoration internally, they have been becoming trendier and trendier and not just in Mexico, but like all North America. So right now, these guys, this couple is producing these plants all over Mexico. They have engaged more than 22 indigenous communities in several Mexican states, and they're now exporting and they're now becoming really, really specialist in like how to make, for example, right now in, in the pandemic, we're all using that gel. What's the name? The sanitizer gel yeah, yeah, that yeah, everyone yeah. is using. And it's really made of like so many things that are kind of toxic. And these guys are doing like a bio sanitizer that is from the cactus. Oh, wow. So like the, the savila from the cactus, that's the one that they're using. So it's a sanitizer that is very much way better for your skin. And it's actually very good for your skin. And it's actually very good for so many other things. And this helps, for example, if you get burned, you use that same one and it heals skin. So there are so many properties of this native biodiversity in Mexico that are not just ornamental. You know, they are really good in terms of pharma like natural pharmaceuticals, beauty, like so many things. And so these amazing couple have been engaging more and more and more producers. And the beauty is that more than 60% of the earnings go directly to the producers, to the last mile producers. So for me, that has been really transformative. These guys are biologists, so they're not, you know, managers in origin. They're not business people. You know, they're not driven by profit. They were really driven to how do we preserve the botanical garden? How do we preserve the native species? Like really, really their deeper soul and motivation is Mexican biodiversity. And that is why they have developed now three companies. They are exporting, they are selling, you know, marvelously. They have now a valuation of around $20 million. They're amazing, you know, and now they even sell the plant that paints the dollar green. So literally the US dollar, oh, wow. it gets painted green with a plant that they're selling, you know? So it's one of those things that I'm really enjoying working with them, getting to know them, the way they think, you know, they are biologists at heart. So it's a very different kind of business what a biologist builds. And it's just amazing. How does it manifest? What's the biggest difference or the most surprising difference? How a biologist builds a business? Well, they're very scared of investors at first, for example. <laughs> Precisely because they don't want anyone to change their DNA. They don't want anyone to overdrive profit and to think about some pricing that could perhaps give less to the farmer suppliers or... So what do you say when you feel that from... Because I see that with a lot of family businesses as well, with a lot of businesses actually yeah. are very used and a lot of farmers are very used to the only interaction with the financial world is the bank and usually not an amazing relationship. And so when you start talking about there is a whole other world out there of investors looking to put money to work in a very different way, the first reaction is usually very skeptical. So how do you respond to that? Totally. So And rightfully so. Eh? I'm not saying it's <laughs> they're wrong. but yeah. No, that's why we, for example, when we're helping them or advising their investment round or something, we're like never pointing towards, oh, so many investors that we're going to introduce you to hundreds of investors. Never like that. Like it's always few investors. It's always like five at most. It's always a very targeted approach. And most importantly, the investors that we have cultivated ourselves, precisely because those are the ones we trust the most. And precisely because we think that those will be the most aligned. And what I mean by that is that we try to have multi-stakeholders. We try to not only cultivate investors, but also entrepreneurs and other type of stakeholders that we need. And wh when I mean cultivate, I mean infuse them with a different paradigm, precisely because we want them to be in a very understanding point. And one day we divided the group and we said, okay, what if we do one week with only entrepreneurs and one week with only investors, and then we make them meet. 
and the transactions happened really quickly. Like in less than four months, there were six transactions. And it was precisely because, you know, we had given them both the same vocabulary, the same, you know, paradigms, everything that when they met, they were already speaking on the same terms. And I think that's what gave the fluidity of the relationship. And precisely because they had trusted us and we were like the trusted partner for both. And that was what really helped. So I think of myself sometimes as butter. <laughs> Explain. You know how you use butter, right? In, in recipes. Maybe butter is not the key ingredient because, you know, the most important players here are the entrepreneurs and the, and the investors. You know, those are the key ingredients. But butter makes it work. And butter uh, makes it not stick. And butter gives the lubrication, you know, that it needs. So for me, I, I believe like we in, in the culture of SBX, we apply the butter quality everywhere and always like a, a translation quality and a service, you know, it's always been in service of both. So we need to disclose that because are you working, you know, on this, like on behalf of the investor? Are you working on behalf of the entrepreneur? And we say we're working on behalf of regeneration. And it's really clear that they know who's paying who and absolute transparency there so that everyone knows, you know, what's really going on in a transaction, but also to trust the transaction in a different way. So we're radically transparent. We're radically collaborative. And we really, you know, we learn a lot from butter and from soil. <laughs> Super interesting. And with this view you've had over the last years and of course, train, not training, educating and inspiring and nudging these investors and also the entrepreneurs, what do you see as most neglected in Mexico as uh, in general, I think in the impact investing space, but let's look at the regeneration space. What do you would love that more people would work on to really make the regeneration space bloom? as it could and should, because it sounds like I've never been, but it sounds like the ideal place because of a lot of opportunities and a lot of issues. And obviously climate change is hitting very hard, but at the same time, you have a biodiversity rich an incredible biodiversity rich place. Yeah. What do you see as the most neglected piece of the puzzle? I would really love the finance people to be seduced by Mexico's biological wealth and actually Latin Americans biological wealth. And what I mean by that is that right now, all Latin America is very seduced by Silicon Valley and is very in love with tech centricity. And that's dangerous because, you know, this is not Silicon Valley at all. And the way that Silicon Valley flows is very different from how Latin America flows. And the level of, for example, in the global north, you have the business driven transactions come from a cognitive trust. And in Latin America, they come mostly from an affective trust, you know, from being friends of your friends and people who know. And, you know, there's some level of affective trust in the global north as well. But in, in Latin America, it's very different. So what I see is that the, the finance people right now are very much in love with the Silicon Valley model and they are like revering technology and they have become blind to like the biological wealth of Latin America, we have more than a third of the world's biodiversity and we could be the answer to so many of the climate problems. And we could be, you know, Latin America could be the potential solution of like half of the, half of the problem, you know? <laughs> and like, really, I don't see people valuing that. They want Peru to be the new Silicon Valley. They want Mexico to be the new Silicon Valley instead of, you know, seeing, no, we have so much here. You know, you have this beauty, you have some of the happiest countries in the world. And there's a reason for that. You know, there's a reason for us to be happy because we have a model that even though we're not very rich and even though we lack so many services and even though there's always messy stuff going with the corruption and the insecurity and all of that all throughout Latin America, even with all of that, you have some of the happiest population. And why is that? And, you know, behavioral scientists have come here and have seen that it's usually because of companionship, of friendship and of love. Like those are the real pieces of fundamental things that make us happy and not, you know, the access to services or income. So what we have is so precious and so valuable that we should be exporting it instead of importing all those unhappiness paradigms that we don't really need. So why do you think that these local financiers and investors get so 
interested in the shininess of Silicon Valley or of New York or of London or whatever. What's the, because they've grown up, I'm assuming in Latin America, in Mexico, and they know, or they should know what is possible, but yet they get very, very interested in shiny objects, meaning whatever rounds, very short-term funds focused on software, et cetera, et cetera. Totally. I think it's also because the highly educated people in Latin America also educate themselves in the global north. They go to many of these universities. You know, they, I mean, I did an exchange as well. And there's so many people that to consider yourself highly educated, you need to look to the global north. And basically that's a paradigm right now that, that unfortunately it's real and it's happening. So people look up to the global north and whatever is happening there and they consider it or value it more highly than whatever is going on locally. And that is a, you know, that's why I continuously say we need to re-indigenize finance and re-indigenize ourselves because everyone, we're all indigenous to earth. The thing is we have perhaps not value it as such. Precisely because right now the money paradigm, money can come from anywhere and go everywhere. And when, you know, when they get bored of this, they go to another thing and they don't have roots. And that's precisely what's degrading ecosystems. Like, for example, here in, in Mexico, the land for industrial agriculture, it's rented. And it's rented precisely because they know for a fact that they will be degrading that land. And in 10 years time, you know, it won't be able to grow anything and they will move. So that's something that makes you not be rooted. Comes back to the owning piece you mentioned before. Yeah. And it comes back to the longevity of your decisions. Like if you're a long-term decision maker for that piece of land versus when you're a short-term decision maker for that land. So I think if the money paradigm is to be sector driven instead of place driven, it will degrade natural capital by default. And in the other case, if we make money be place based, and decisions be longer term, then we become rooted to place and we care. And we care about, you know, what our decisions today might affect the rivers of tomorrow and the air of tomorrow that we will breathe tomorrow or our children will breathe. So I think the re-indigenizing process is really important because it roots us to place. And it that is something that all finance needs. Like finance needs to become less sector driven, more place driven, because that's the only way we will actually see what we're degrading or regenerating. If you're not rooted in place, you don't see that. Everything is abstract. Everything is in a, in a statement or an Excel spreadsheet. And that's not visible. That's not concrete. And would that be your advice, obviously without giving investment advice, but imagine there's a, as a theater of investors, smart investors listening to this and get really excited. What would be your advice to them as a next step without giving financial or investment advice, would that be to find those roots and to go deeper in the place wherever they find themselves or wherever they feel themselves drawn to, or would it be something else? This might sound very hippie, but I believe everyone must fall in love with place and finance must fall in love with life and literally fall in love. And what I mean fall in love is that when you love somebody, you care, you ask, you're curious, you listen, you share. It's like anything that comes from the love paradigm. Like I really like, you know, Daniel, Daniel Christian Wall, uh, you know, he writes so much about regeneration. And there's a question he asks about like, what is so worth sustaining about humanity? You know, why do we want to sustain humanity? And of course, any answer that you come up with, it's always down to, it comes down to love, like anything worth sustaining in this planet is love. And if we start doing our financial decisions really from a place of love, it's very, very different than from a place of fear. From a place of fear, you start controlling and you want to control everything because you fear everyone and you fear everything. And from a place of love, it's very different. And you start with the trust qualities and you start, you know, trusting and you start letting go and you start liberating yourself as well as others. So I, I believe that uh, my advice is that if you fall in love with place, you start being curious about it. You start listening to it. You start seeing it. You start caring. You hurt when you see a tree taken down for construction. You hurt when you see a, a river changing direction because of a developer. You start hurting for real. And you start caring for real and you start being a steward for real 
of place. That is the way I think of re re-indigenization, like the rooting of us in place, the falling in love with place so that we can care that much, that we can listen that deep, that we can act that far. And that way, capital would really be at the service instead of being like at the dominant party. I think that's what's needed, not just in Mexico, everywhere. <laughs> it's beautiful advice. And I'm going to ask you maybe a tricky or difficult question, but what if overnight you'd be in charge of quite a large investment portfolio? So somehow you get a phone call and from tomorrow morning onwards, you are the fund manager of, let's say, a billion dollars, which is still quite a lot of money. I mean, this is in Corona times. Let's say the billions have been flying around, so it could be 10 billion, but let's say a lot of money. What would be your first steps? I'm, I'm interested not in the exact dollar amounts. I'm interested in where would you prioritize? What would you look at first if you had to put it to work? Let's say the duration of the fund is absolutely could be evergreen, doesn't, but it has to be investments, not necessarily grants. Yeah, I love evergreen. So, of course, I shift to where I know most, which is Latin America. We have worked in in Mexico, in Colombia, in Chile, in Peru. Right now, we're very active in Peru and in Central America. So, of course, since the one that I know the most is Latin America, I would, of course, start in Latin America. I think there's priority ecosystems right now, and not just for the potential that they have of mitigation and adaptation to climate change, but also for the potential regeneration. Like globally, you know, there's so much that Latin America can do for that, as I mentioned earlier. So I think most of my investment thesis would be to to go directly with the indigenous communities that have been the best stewards of these ecosystems and co-create with them the investment thesis. I believe, you know, they know much more, they know way better, and they have been there for the longest. And I believe they are really the regenerators today. And I definitely think they're seriously underfunded, but I also think the way the funding is coming is usually benefiting more roads, more infrastructure, you know, more gray, precisely because that's what the Black Rocks value. You know, those are the private equities way of doing things. And I want the indigenous way of doing things. I like the Buen Vivir Fund. I don't know if you know them. I like, you know, the cooperative funds, the ones that act as a cooperative, precisely because they share risk and they share benefits and they share everything. And I want to be co-partnering. I want to be partners with these indigenous communities. I wouldn't want them to be beneficiaries. So that's where I would go. And I'm sorry, but we take away your fund for a moment, but you have a magic power and you can change one thing in the food and agriculture or even land use um, sector, but also sea, as you mentioned before, with Playa Viva. And what would be your one thing you would change overnight? <gasps> Agrochemicals. <laughs> Agrochemicals, for sure. It's interesting. It's the second time, I think, in a few days, somebody brings that up in an interview. Yeah. You would basically ban them overnight <sighs> or make them disappear? I mean. I'm very active in working on the transition. I believe, you know, because of food, food sovereignty reasons and because of so many things, there are so many things at play. But in Mexico, at least, it has become kind of a cartel. You know, sometimes you're like experimenting in a plot and, and there's a pilot and they're putting, you know, the biofertilizers, the one that are not fossil fuels, and somebody comes and like poisons it so that you look bad precisely and, and that your crop yield will not get to the point of success on purpose. So right now it is it is really, really toxic, not just in the chemicals themselves, but like the way they're operating is dangerous, like truly dangerous. And the last secretary of environment in the Mexican government was fired because he had, you know, said something against agrochemicals that was too radical. And in his house, he got like basically covered his house with agrochemicals one night wow. and he had to resign. So it has become very dangerous. Like Simply because there's too much money going on or because they feel the pressure. What do you see? Or are there subsidies involved because there's, there's subsidies there's government relations, there's so many things, but there's basically regulations in Mexico are very, very soft and vague and optional. And the ones that are allowed are too many. And precisely when Europe bans something, Mexico and Latin America take decades to ban it. 
So it's like it's considered poisonous and cancerous and everything in the global north. And in the global south, we're still like receiving it because they still want to make it and they want to produce it and they want to get rid of it and they get rid of it in the global south. So, you know, we get things that are like very toxic, very poisonous. There's, you know, the city where my husband comes from is one of the highest in, in, in leukemia. And it's precisely one of the most agrochemical intensive states in Mexico. And it's the one that exports the most to the U.S. So, you know, there's an absolute correlation. And do you see that the consumers, as we're seeing now in, I can only speak for part of the global north, but there, there is a lot of discussion now on agrochemicals. There's a lot of research coming out, which was already there, but somehow through the Zach Bushes and through French research, etc., suddenly we're looking differently at some of these and you see... For the first time, I think even in the organic movement, we've never seen that you see actually consumers getting at least worried. And there's discussion on banning certain things at scale, at state level or even country level. And you see the actions of some of these companies getting more desperate, which is usually a good sign because it means that they're in trouble. Do you see any of the consumer worrisome of that is this is a health crisis in, in Latin America or not yet? Of course. No, no, there's so much. There's so much going on. There's so much activism. The thing is, how can you fight such a huge system, you know, from wherever you are? And I really love and admire a woman entrepreneur. Her name is Adriana Luna. I was just talking to her yesterday. Adriana Luna, her company is called Tierra de Monte. And basically she used to work for those agrochemical companies. She and her husband are scientists and they used to work for them. And their daughter was born with like all of these allergies and stuff about agrochemicals. And they started feeding her like everything organic and everything. So they quit their profession because they started realizing the absolute correlations. And now they started this new company and everything is, you know, without fossil fuels. And they're like really, really being activists in like the change and the shift of inputs for agriculture in, in the whole of Mexico, but in a very, how would I say, like expert science driven way that they, they are amazing and they have a big heart. She just won the Cartier Award, the Cartier Woman Award last year. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's been very recognized, but still like her everyday work is still very hard. Precisely because of like everything I've been saying. What brings me hope is that right now, you know, the Paris Agreement that we had all this, you know, agreement about temperature and now the Kumin, the one, that, the summit that is coming in China for the CBD, the, the Convention for Biodiversity. I am hoping that will be, you know, uh, before and after that summit. And what I really like is that in the first draft, the first thing they said was two thirds of agrochemicals needs to go. And even though we could be more radical and World Wildlife Fund is like saying that that's not enough and that we need to blah, blah, blah. But at least the first draft. The fact that it's there. The yeah. fact that it's there. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. This is so important. This is key. And I am worried that many ESG funds include so many agrochemical companies that for me, this is a discussion that we have waited too long. And if it's so clear that fossil fuels are like, let's say, kind of an enemy in terms of climate change, where can we start the conversation as soon as possible about agrochemicals? Because they also come from fossil fuels and they're super urgent. And it's one of the thresholds. And they do a lot of damage. Yeah. Exactly. In planetary boundaries is one of the thresholds that we have crossed the farthest. Like it's super violated threshold, the one of agrochemicals. And in Mexico, our most hot tourist spot, which is Cancun, it's completely filled with sargassum. And it's supposedly, there's a correlation of too much fertilizer going into the sea that is making the algae bloom so much that mm -hmm. it eutrophicates or suffocates the life underneath. And they become basically like all, all our beautiful beaches, the, the ones that were the, like the Mexican paradise that everyone came for are right now like suffocated with sargassum and it smells horrible. And it's been like that for years now. And it's all because of agrochemicals being dumped into the Mexican Gulf. So it's the runoffs. Yeah. It's something no, no, that it's... needs to stop yesterday. Like, and <laughs> we can talk about uh, for hours about this. We had a discussion. Mm -hmm. It's not out yet, I think, but on, on the subsidies going into that, the schemes are fascinating and potentially have a lever there actually to turn some of those subsidies into transition finance or, or ways to transition many farmers. But I want to be conscious of your time as well and end, I don't think it's the last time we talk, but end with a, a final question. Inspired by John Kempf, where are you contrarian? What do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture that others don't? 
I believe that right now the regenerative agriculture movement is not necessarily placing as much voice in indigenous communities as we should. Like the voice that are speaking about regenerative agriculture globally are not all indigenous voices. Most of them are not. And they're the ones who know the most and who have been the stewards for the longest. And I have learned so much by going to the fields in, in Mexico. There's one person in, in Michoacán, he's indigenous uh, Tlaxcaltecan, and he has taught me so much. And he doesn't have one eye precisely because he lost it to agrochemicals. And he can tell you with so much wisdom about like the fact that the land where he is cultivating, it is called Masawa land. And Masawa is indigenous for the stewards of corn. And he says, every tortilla that you eat here is a conversation with our ancestors because we have been taking care of these seeds for so many generations that the seed that you have in your hand right now is a consequence of so many generations and so much oral wisdom and so much indigenous wisdom of like having the corn today. So when you bite into that tortilla, the experience is like the, the aroma, everything is like, ah, I, mind blowing, <laughs> mind blowing. My skin, you know, is like, ah, like feeling it, like everything. And, and the way he talks to you about precisely, you know, the, the massive agriculture versus versus the one that he calls alternative because he didn't know, you know, regenerative agriculture, he just calls it alternative. And when I listen to him, I understand that the ones that should be learning from them are us and that the voice should be on them and that they are really the wisdom carriers and the wisdom holders. So I think indigenous voice should be key, centerpiece, everything. And they should have much more global south component in all the conversations because the, most of the biodiversity that we need to save is in the global south. So I'm, I'm like very worried that the conversation and the thought leadership is controlled by the global north. And that's where I'm contrarian. Thank you so much, Laura, for your time today to share and, and for your insights and, and all your wisdom. And thank you for all the work you do. Uh, thank you so much. No, we have really had a lot of fun learning in SVX and your podcast has really been valuable for our team. Thank you so much. And, you know, we're, some of our, our team members are considering, of course, the course and, and everything. And, and we're really excited about what you're doing and, and the connections that you're driving globally. So thank you for having us. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. It's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash egg or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, 
And we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you, if this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you wanna dig deeper. We're gonna look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking, click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.